Good morning. There was a young girl that graduated from Bible school in West Africa, Ghana, recently, and when she was one years old, very, very, I don't think she was even one year old, she had a case of malaria, which she would, they just said that she wasn't going to make it. So it was my first time in West Africa when I moved there in 88. So Pastor John Jason said, would you come and would you pray for this child with me? So we prayed for the child and I could feel the malaria fever, the heat come into our hands. I could feel it come in. It was like miraculous. God does miracles, amen? amen. When I had a stroke. I had a stroke in the country of Ghana because of what took place in um, Mali and Guinea. And they said that I could never, I would never do anything again. I, it, was a, it was a stroke. I didn't know how to eat anymore, drive a car. Uh, somebody had to tell me how to go to the bathroom. And the doctor who was the greatest neurological surgeon in America, Dr. Robert Early, said, look at the scan of your brain. It's done. I want to just show you because you're going to have to find something to do at home. I said, I have a better doctor than you. <clears throat> and to God be the glory, you know. He said, you'll never speak again. You can't minister again. It's over, Christian-wise. I said, I'll tell you who it's over for unless you get saved. I said, it's over for you. And really, I believe it, that God does miracles. We've seen so many things happen in our course of time. We're not uh, hyper about it. We're not strange about it. But we believe that God touches people's lives. Pastor Alfred will be speaking at the 1045, 11 o'clock service. I just wanted to say a couple of things. Um, Pastor Alfred is from Liberia. He oversees... 26 churches in the country of Liberia. He was in a 17-year war, and the only time they could come out of the house was to find food. 17 years in, a, in, in your house. In your house. Can't come out. And you come out, sneak on, and sometimes you send the women out, right? Because yeah, they wouldn't be killed as easily. And so this war, if you go to Liberia, you see the ravages of the war in Liberia. It's unbelievable even now what's taking place. But he was in a refugee camp. And uh, I, went to, I was driving by this camp. They called it Bujumbura. And you could smell the camp when you drove by. No running water, no sewers. It was unbelievable, uh, the situation. And the Holy Spirit told me to go into the camp and start a Bible study. Actually, I, I did more than a Bible study. I started teaching Survey of Doctrine from Lewis Sperry Schaefer's 52 Major Bible Themes. And guess who came from the refugee camp? Him. That place stunk. It was hot. It was horrific. What? Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. But he has a remarkable testimony. He'll be also sharing at the next service. But uh, he's been a great friend. He's going to be moving back to Liberia with his wife and two children and being there maybe a year or so to get things established. He has, uh, we're going to be building an orphan's home in Liberia. We have uh, 200 plus orphans with an organization called Children of Grace. And the way we do orphans is the orphans come to, they're in a church, they're in a, uh, a Greater Grace church, a Greater Grace home, a Greater Grace Christian school that has a Greater Grace Bible college. In other words, we want these kids raised up, and some of them that are in you. We have a lot of Rwandese. I was in Rwanda right after the genocide. I stayed in the Hotel Rwanda. Anybody ever see that movie? I stayed in that hotel. And after the genocide, we have a lot of, a lot of orphans in Uganda especially that are, a uh, majority of our orphans are, are Tutsi tribe orphans from Rwanda. And it's amazing what God is doing with these orphans. We support 200 of these children and remarkable to see some of them. One of them told me recently, I'm going to Somalia. I said, oh, oh really? Somalia? I said, isn't that one of the nations Jesus said to go into? Go into all nations? Isn't Somalia a nation? I'm like, yeah. And she said, didn't you preach missions? I went, 
I mean, she was disciplining me with my own messages, which is really good, you know. So he'll be sharing at the next service. God bless you. Okay. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 1 this morning. And as we start there, we spoke at the 8 o'clock service. You have to forgive my squinting. When I had that, I had a stroke, actually, also. Um, and the stroke knocked my left eye out. I have a really good, it's really great. I had my hip removed, so I have no hip. My right eye does, my right ear doesn't hear, my left eye doesn't see. People get insulted sometimes. They'll put their hand out, but they're over here. They say, you didn't shake my hand. I said, never saw you. Then somebody's talking to me over here, and I'm, I'm like paying no mind. I, I don't hear what you're saying. There's no ear that works. Isn't that great that God gave us like two eyes, two ears, and, and really like one mouth, you know? Uh, <clears throat> some of us have a bigger one than others, you know, like big mouth, you know? My wife calls me motor mouth. She says, like, how, how do you speak six hours straight? I said, God. She goes, are you plugged in somewhere? And I have a great wife. I've been with her 48 years. And she is like the backbone of the ministry. I mean, she lived with me in Africa. We, were, we lived in Ghana, and we moved there in 88. And then we, lived, we went to Uganda after Idi Amin. And then we moved to South Africa, and she's actually working as an administrator in the Bible college. And uh, we have a great time together. I, one of the keys to our marriage is we evangelize together every week together. We knock on doors together. We tell people about Christ together. That's one of the keys, I think, to, to the marriage is we, we are walking with God together in the marriage. And um, I, I led her. I'm going to get to the message. because I got all day. I don't know how much time you've got. but No, I'm just joking. Um, my wife's father died, and she had a nervous breakdown. And I was an unsaved. I had been to five universities, very educated, but an unsaved, educated drug addict having used for 16 years cocaine, pills, everything you could think of. So when I heard about this death, and she was an only child, I didn't know what to do, so I read of the Bible for three days straight. She got saved. I went back to getting high. I put the Bible down. I said, that's nice. Goodbye. I'm going over there. And you know what? She began to pray, and I was born again January 6th, 7 o'clock, 1976. And that was... Uh, so actually, her, her witness, I used the Bible to lead her to Christ, and I was an unbeliever. How about that one? You think God isn't sovereign, and God can't use any situation. Are you with me? Saying, praise the Lord then. I mean, amen. And then, then, then she starts praying for me, and I get saved, and um, that is, God is miraculous. I mean, it's, it's, he's a miracle-working God. In Revelation chapter 1, we spoke in the 8 o'clock service, about having a personal walk with God. That Satan is not a person. And what he wants to perpetrate in Christianity is impersonal Christians and impersonal churches with an impersonal gospel. That's why there's so much going on that takes away from this personal life with God. And uh, I was thinking about how churches have become ecclesiastical organizations, concerts, hospitals, celebrity shows, entertainment centers, miracle sideshows, political forums, philosophical and psychological reasoning uh, operations, um, finance centers, dating games, United Nations feeding processors, uh, helpers physically, crisis management, and uh, religious life duty. I just said 15 things. I don't even know what I said. Uh, really, well, a church has gone so far away, and some of these things are good, but what I'm saying is overall, the church is so impersonal. That's why I love your church. Your church is very personal. I was personally picked up by the pastor when I was uh, drinking a very cold cup of coffee that tasted horrible. And then he gave me another cup of coffee here, and I'll be waiting for my chocolate on chocolate donut. I'm really into health, you can tell. No, it's okay if you are. Have a great day. I, I, I've eaten everything. I don't even want to tell you what I've eaten in Africa. We won't go there. Sometimes knowing, sometimes not knowing. 
But um, we talked about Galatians 2.9. And don't turn there because we're going to go to Revelation. You can if you want. Please don't let me tell you what to do. Uh, they say the greatest, Charles Spurgeon said the greatest distance on planet Earth is the distance from the pulpit to the pew. He said that's the greatest distance because it really is a lot of warfare going on with people not applying what they hear personally. And that's what I want to do. I don't want anybody elbowing their wife or husband, uh, wife elbowing. They say, do you hear what he's saying? You know, it's about God speaking to us personally. Amen. And I, I was up at 219 last night. I went to bed at 12, got up at 219, and I couldn't fall back to sleep. And I realized God just wanted to be personal with me. Who needs sleep? What's sleep anyway? I worked in a prison. I used to work three days in a row without sleeping. And that's an interesting place to work in a prison with all convicted murderers where there's no death sentence in the state. Guess what? Killing you is no big deal. Killing you is no big deal because they're already in jail for their life. So you, have to, you never turned your back. You never turned your back, but you got to know uh, God. And I thought God wants to be personal to me. And uh, right now, regardless of what I think about sleep, I know what's great for you. I know you can quote to me, he gives his beloved sleep, but Jesus spent a lot of nights just, you know, thinking with his father. Amen? Isn't that good? Huh? It's, it's good. It's good. And so Galatians 2.9, Paul said, because of a problem in Galatia, and by the way, it's the same problem that I'm just checking in case I want to walk down here uh, where I am. I don't, do, do people do that? Do they, like, walk the, sometimes I do that, you know? It's a little bit unconventional. One time I went to a Baptist church, sorry to say it was Baptist, the guy had the microphone screwed in to the pulpit. And then he said to me, we want to see your message before you preach. I'm like, it's up here. I don't, I don't like do my message out. I don't know what you talk. Even notes, I don't even look at them. They're right there. And when he was praying, I unscrewed the microphone. <laughs> and, then, and then that pastor became a great friend of mine. He said, yeah, you're really not really normal. I said, of course not. I mean, God uses insane people. David's mighty men were chafed in the mind. As it was said, they were chafed in the mind and they had valiant hearts. That's the kind of Christians we need. Chafed in the mind means not thinking normally. But being chafed means you're just a little bit erratic, you know, but a valiant heart. I don't always have a valiant heart. I remember I was in a car surrounded by 24 lions once. And I was like sweating profusely, chattering of teeth. And I said, what if the, what if the car doesn't start... I don't want to be a holy cannoli for a lion. I'm Italian. So, Paul says in Galatians 2.9, trouble with grace. After he preached the grace message, Acts 13.43, 14.3, 14.26, and 15.40 of Acts. After he preached the grace message, Judaizers came up that said you got to be circumcised and you got to follow the law of Moses. Ever met people like that? I know you're not any of those. Or you got to be baptized to be saved. I met a pastor and he said to me, that you have to, I said, oh, is it the water of man or the blood of God? Of course you do. I believe in baptism. Everybody should get baptized when they get saved. But don't tell me if I go out and baptize everybody in Gambia, there's a million Muslims there, that just because I baptize them, they're all saved. Okay personal. So grace was under attack. And because Satan is not a person, he wants Christianity to be impersonal. He wants my life with God to be impersonal, my marriage to be impersonal, raising my children to be impersonal, where I, everywhere, I, everything impersonal. Keep it impersonal. An impersonal world with the way we're advancing, it's incredible. Somebody said to me, do you have an iPhone? I said, I put my, I put a phone up under my glasses. I said, and I, I don't have a cell phone, let alone an iPhone. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that's right. You should have a cell phone. My wife said to me, you're going out. I know where you're going. Like, you, the car might break down or whatever. I said, I'll walk. Whatever, you know. Uh, but it's amazing. You know, you can't connect with anybody now. But with this advancing of technology, if we're not careful, Christianity becomes very impersonal. It becomes a very impersonal. By the way, Pastor Allen, you know, I don't need to go to church. I can watch it on TV. You're weird. You're a weirdo. I want to see you 2 John, 3 John, 12 and 16. I long to see you face to face. I'm getting a little riled up here. Is that okay with you? That's okay. I, I want to see you face to face. I watch it on the internet. 
Would you get anointed? No, you didn't. Don't tell me, well, God, I'm not saying God can't use it. I'll be going to Dallas, Texas soon to be uh, doing 24-7 TV broadcasts into Iran and be teaching the Bible into Iran. We have a church, by the way. We have a church in the capital of Iran, Greater Grace. We don't talk about it. I'm doing it now. We have nine churches in, in, inside of China. We sent 20 missionaries to China just the last couple of years. And uh, it's, it's amazing. So that it can, I, I know those things can be used, but I'm talking about in our lives, we need to personally speak to people. Going to be with all those basketball players last night, it killed me not to play. I played for, from five, when I was five to when I was 63. It was murder not to play. I'm not a spectator. I want to get in the football game tonight. <laughs> I don't care if it hurts. <laughs> no, I can watch it. I'll watch the game maybe later on, the highlights or something, if it's on still after we're done here tonight. I don't know how long I'll go on tonight for, but whatever. The pastor's here. He'll tell me what to do. But um, really, that Paul said, they perceived the grace in me. Peter and James and John saw grace in him. That's Galatians 1, 15 and 16. But when God saw me, when it pleased God, he separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. And he says, and they glorified God in me. 124 of Galatians. They saw God in him. I saw God in your song leader today. God's in him. Amen. He was on fire for God. It's awesome. It's awesome, you know. But he said, they saw grace in me. And we said, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, it says this, that I begged the Lord three times, and he said with finality, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. It's my grace for you. <laughs> Philippians 1, 7, you are partakers of my grace. Romans 2.16, it's my gospel. Isn't that awesome? We take ownership of it because God gave us the, not power of the Holy Spirit, but the person of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that awesome? Pentecostals out there are sad that they, they think it's just a power. It's not a power, it's a person. He, when he has come, when he has come, John 14, 15, and 16, when he has come, say he's a, he, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Get it? Person. And so this was key. Second Samuel 22, David said 20 times, he's my God, my lamp, my light, my salvation, my rock, my high tower. He said my 20 times. Because it was personal. The Lord is what? Your shepherd? What's it say? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He's my shepherd. He's my Jesus. Amen? I love it. So Revelation chapter 1, this is what he says in verses 4 through 6. That he washed me from my sins, right? And he cleansed me in, in his own blood. The blood is applied for me. And he made us kings and priests. He loved us. He washed us. And he made us. Isn't that awesome? I'm on the Isle of Patmos. I'm 90 years old. 98, everybody's gone, but I got Jesus. Hallelujah. Everybody's gone. I wonder what the end of the Christian life is. Maybe nobody's there. He's all alone, and he's on a, a prison island surrounded by sharks. I used to go swimming in West Africa until I went to the market one day and saw about 24 hammerhead sharks. I said, where these come from? The guy said, the water. I'm like, there goes swimming. And I used the bathtub. <laughs> my God. My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory. And this is awesome. Personal Jesus. This is personal. He's, he's all alone. I mean, you could get insecure, lonely. 
Where did everybody go? What happens to all the people I loved and discipled? Well, God allowed this to happen so you will experience Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. I will never leave you nor forsake you. What about these people that believe you can lose God? What are they, weird? I met a Pentecostal pastor, and he said to me, you can lose the Holy Spirit. I said, oh, really? I said, so for what sin? He goes, well, I said, oh, so who determines what sin you lose the Holy Spirit for? Then I said, let me ask you a couple questions. You got a minute? He said, sure. I said, is Israel God's people? He said, yes. I said, does God have a covenant with them? He said, yes. I said, did they kill God's son? Said, he said, yeah. I said, did God take away the covenant? Can you do anything worse than kill his son? Hello? Huh? He said, uh, I got to go. He said, I got to go. Can't answer the question. Hebrew, what? Hebrews 13, 5 and 6 says, never, right? Personally, he's with me. Joshua 1, 5. He will not fail me nor forsake me. Him and me. You know, those two Hebrew words are amazing. One speaks of putting you down. Failing means to put you down. Loose your hold on a child. Imagine if you do this to a child in Walmart. You have Walmart here? I don't know. You put the child down, and then forsake means you walk away. Now, if you put a child down in a grocery store, he can still see you. He's a little bit nervous and upset a baby. But you walk away ballistic. The kid's going crazy. God says, I will never put you down or walk away. Isn't that awesome? Never! And it's five times he says it in the original Greek language. I will not, I will not, I will not, I will not, I will not. Five times he says it. I will never leave you nor forsake you. You're mine and I'm yours. And no matter what takes place, are you with me? It's personal. And that means when I personally sin, he gives me personal mercy. I have a personal repentance, and I get personal mercy. Amen? Mark chapter 2, what did Jesus say to the paralytic? My son. He didn't say, the first two words out of his mouth were, my son, your sins are forgiven you. Now rise up and walk. Right? My son. This my son was lost, but now he's what? He's found. <laughs> Still my son. Prodigal, my son. My son, my son, my son. And by the way, if we're personal towards people that have gone astray and love them. Un by the way, let me ask you a question. I know you know the answer. I'll ask you anyway. Did God, was God loved before you got saved? The Bible says 1 John 4, 8 and 16. God is what? Did he love you before you got saved? What makes you think that if you make a mistake and go the wrong way, he stops loving you? He's ever loving and ever living. I love it. I preached that message in a village in Zambia. Ever loving, ever living. Four years ago. Thursday afternoon. Memory's still good. I don't remember what time it is, but I know that. So it's amazing. It's amazing. So here's what Jesus says in John 13, verse 1. He said he loved his own and he loved them to the end. Isn't that a great verse? Say that. I'm his own. I'm his own. I'm God's, I'm God's own. I'm his own. And then John says in John 13, 23, I am the disciple whom Jesus loves. That's my identity. What's your identity? I'm a pastor. I'm a missions director. I'm a politician. I'm a businessman. I'm a mechanic. I'm a teacher. I, I mean, no, no. I, you know what? One day when you can't do that stuff anymore, what happens to your identity? Your identity is gone when you can't do what you're supposed to do, even if it's in God. I am the disciple whom Jesus loves. That's it. That's my identity. He says in John 13, 23, John 19, 26, he says in John 20, verse 2, he says in John 21, 7, he says it in John 21, 20, five times, he says, you want to know who I am? I'm the disciple whom Jesus loves. He's loving me all the time. It's personal. When I was not saved in 1974. I was in a bar room. My family, <laughs> criminals. The whole family's criminals. 
Okay? No, really. Genovese family in New York. Okay? I don't know if you know anything about that, but it doesn't even matter if you do. I don't want you to. <laughs> my father had a, my grandfather and father had a hotel, a gambling operation, a, uh, a bar room, a restaurant. I was sitting there on narcotics and drunk, half drunk. A girl came in and touched my shoulder. She said, excuse me, Jesus loves you. Sorry I had to use that word in church, but it's in the Bible plenty of times. She says, sir, I'm talking to you. Little girl, little girl, little girl. Like, you know, this place is filled with maniacs, with guns, drugs. I'm talking to you. I said, do me a favor. Go talk to somebody else. I'm not interested. She goes, God sent me to you. I'm like, what? I took her and I said, excuse me, I brought her to the door. It was my place. It was like my family's. And I closed the door. Very relieved because there's a lot of conviction. Hi. She said, I've been sent to you. Tell you God loves you. I said, I'm, you know what? Now I took her and walked her up the street and pushed her. I don't think you understand how much God loves you. Now, th then she went away after that. You know what? Those words never left my brain. They never left my brain for two years until they got saved. All I could think of was that little girl with that voice, Jesus loves you. This is what John is saying. There's this personal relationship with God. And this is key. What does Paul say at the end of his life, 2 Timothy 4, 16 through 20? He said that my first answer no man stood with me, but the Lord stood with me. Isn't that awesome? And by the way, most people, when they exegete that, say it was as if Jesus was right in the prison cell. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. You know what the lion was saying? See, when Paul said he was delivered out of the mouth of the lion in 2 Timothy chapter 4, it didn't mean he was going to be delivered from death because he got his head cut off. What he meant was Satan was trying to stop him from preaching even when he was in prison. And he was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. I was arrested in Jordan. And they, uh, they took me, after one day of interrogation, they took me to their CIA in the mountains of Jordan because I was distributing literature, which I feel I'll do wherever I want. I don't care about laws. Tell me you can't do it in the mall. Don't tell me that because what you tell me, I'm going to do it. I grew up that way. Maybe it's something wrong. Mentally, I'm ill. So they took me up, and the guy said to me, after th three days, he said to me, do you know that this is a seven-year sentence? I said, can I tell you something, buddy? I said, number one, if you kill me, I'm going to heaven. I said, number two, if you give me a jail sentence, I start a church. I said, number three, if you let me go, I go to get to see my wife again. He said, you know, he said, the guy, this guy is something, get him out of the country. Deport him out of the country. And I was deported. They put me on an airplane, and they put, they stamped it in my passport, never to enter Jordan again. And when, you know the window in the plane, when they're looking at you and you're starting the taxi, I showed him another passport. I said, I put two in the window. I got, by the way, I got four of them anyway. I keep four, Italian, American, one that used just for Israel, just in case, because I've, I've been jailed seven times in Islamic countries, and it's been fun, actually. I was in McDonald's. It reminded me last night. I was in McDonald's, and I gave a woman a track, and within one minute, I was handcuffed. I said, wow, they're fast. <laughs> they, took me, they took me to jail, and I said to the guy, you go get me my french fries. I left them at McDonald's. I want the french fries. Get me the french fries! So they brought a guy in to interrogate me, and he came in about hours later, and he said to me, I'm going to let you go. He said, because I was in Detroit, one of your cities, and somebody gave me a gospel track, and I prayed to Jesus. He said, the interrogator says, so just go. Just go. I got arrested with my wife in Yugoslavia in 1981. I'm sorry to tell you all these stories, but they're, they're just good stories. My wife and I, it was great because we were in the same cell. 
I figure if we're going to be jail, we might as well be together. <laughs> Still have kids, all, you know, whatever, you know. Doesn't matter. We're in the same cell anyway. So they said, they brought a guy in to speak to us. And he said to me, he said, I can't explain something, but I had a dream last night about somebody named Jesus. Can you explain who he is? I got let go again. Because God was what? Personal. God was personal. This is awesome. You know when Jesus says to them in Matthew chapter uh, 28, he said, go into all the world and make disciples. But you know what it says? It says, I am with you always. I'm sorry to tell you it doesn't say it exactly like that. If you look at a good Greek translation and an Aramaic Bible, this is what it says. With you is I am. Exodus 3. No, really, it's, it's the same principle, I am with you always. But God was saying to them, I am personally going to be with you. Even though I've gone, even though I've ascended, even though I'm leaving, I am personally with you. In your marriage, God is with you. Amen? At your job. You know, do you, anybody work around unsaved people? Hello? You know what? It's real easy to take up their trends, isn't it? Unless I really understand that God is with me and I'm on a mission. I'm on a mission where I am. I'm on a mission. I was an engineering contractor. I was on a mission. I worked in a prison for murderers under 18. I'm on a mission. God's with me. I'll never leave you. Personal God. This is awesome. And you look at every, how, how did the epistles ended? Paul says he's with me. Peter it's so, it's amazing. Peter understood when God walked on the water to him. What did Jesus say to him in Matthew 14? Fear not, I am. I'm personally with you, Peter. You know, the resurrection is so amazing. Many people celebrate it. They talk about the 12 resurrection appearances of Christ, and it's true. But I love it how he was personal. I appeared to James. I appeared to Peter. I appeared to uh, Thomas. I appeared, right? And time and time again to Mary, Right? Someone once said that he appeared to Mary first because he couldn't take the crying. She was just crying for days. And he appeared to her. It was all personal resurrection appearances. Isn't that amazing? God wants to be personal. When I read the Bible, do I, get, do I get personal words from God? I don't want to just read black letters on white pages. I want God to speak to me. Amen? God wants to speak to me through the Spirit. Isn't it easy? I can't understand how people can't. I don't know what, I don't know what to do. Watch this. Is the Holy Spirit in you? Hello? Did the Holy Spirit write the Bible? How do you make it work? Spirit in me, Spirit wrote the Bible. Read the Bible, God's going to speak, amen? God's going to speak through the pastor. Revelation 2 and, chapter, and Revelation 3. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. God is a personal God. I am El Shaddai. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Abraham, stop playing around. I made you a promise of a son. You don't need to go to make Ishmael come out of this. Eleazar cannot live in your sight. I'm going to give you a son, and it may take 25 years, and then at the 40th year, I'm going to have you put a knife through him. Just in case he's not more important to you than me. By the way, you know when it says, you say Jehovah Jireh, actually it's Yahweh Jireh. And this is what it says. Yahweh Jireh means the Lord who sees and the Lord who provides. There's two meanings. It isn't just the Lord providing. It's God sees and God provides. He personally called Abraham. Amen? He personally called Adoniram Judson from Malden, Massachusetts to be the first American missionary, the Baptist that went. He didn't go out as a Baptist. He went out as a Congregationalist, but became a Baptist. And he spent 37 years, lost three wives and three children. How'd you like to marry him? <laughs> marries one, she dies. Marries another, she dies. Marries another, she dies. I'm like, I'm not looking for any proposals from him. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> it's just like, you know. But, and listen to this. When he died, he had 70 disciples. But he won a man who had committed 30 murders. Kao Te Bu. And you know what happened? Kao Te Bu won 50,000 people to Christ. And listen to this. They went to a village and everybody in the village had the same dream that night about a man with a holy book coming. 
And they all got saved. They're called the Karen tribe. It's an amazing story. If you've never read it, Adoniram Judson's book, Beside the Bible, was the book that sent me on the mission field. Judson. Amazing story. I met a Burmese guy recently, and I said to him, who's Judson to you? He started crying. He said, Judson's our hero. They can trace two million converts to Judson's life with his immediate converts and then up through the ages, two million people that were affected by Adoniram Judson. It's unbelievable. God was personal to him in tragedy. When there's tragedy, God's what? Personal. He draws me to himself. Who do I have in heaven but you who on earth? Well, it's God. Psalm 73, 25. I've got God. God is with me. Anybody ever come against you? Ever have any enemies? Somebody say every day. <laughs> The guy, one time I went to visit a student. I had to ask a student to leave school because we found uh, a bag of marijuana in their locker. And I just said, you can't be here anymore. And his father put a gun to my head. He said, I'm going to kill you. He was a heroin addict. I said, well, you're, you're being stupid today. I said, you're going to kill me and go to jail for sending me to heaven? Are you stupid? He started crying, put the gun down and got saved and came to church. I said, God, I, by, by the way, I was shaken. Uh, I wasn't like, you know, going, <laughs> I was like, oh my God, God, <laughs> give me, give me, give me something to say here, okay? And it's awesome. God being personal. We work inner city missions in Baltimore. We have, how many, how many areas are we in in the city? 20? Over 30 areas of the city. We're in there every week. We, we our high school kids go evangelizing. What do you think about that? We take them out door to door and people to people. When they're in sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, tenth grade, and some, some of the parents say, I don't want my kids doing that. There's a, here, here's a list of Christian schools you can go. This is what we do. Our Bible college students, our, our, our Christian school teachers and our kids, we want them to learn how to give people, a, understand how to promote a relationship with Christ. This is the key to our life. Whatever's going on in my life, I just draw near to God. Amen? I draw near to God. Come boldly to the throne of grace to get grace to help in time of need. And even at the end of Paul's life, what did he say in Philippians 3.10? That I may know him. Huh? And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. I want to know God. I don't think because I've been doing this 40 years, and I've been involved with church planting. We've got 212 churches in 20 countries in Africa. I don't come to a conclusion that I think I know something. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. Last night, I couldn't figure out where I was. I woke up, and I said, where the heck am I? I travel six months a year. I'm going for two million miles in the air. I wake up. I don't know where I am. I'm like, God, oh, where am I? Oh, Kansas City. It's Kansas City. Kansas City today. That's exactly right. What's the name of the hotel? Kansas City, Hampton Hotel. Uh -huh. We got it. We got it. We got it, right? And, uh, but God is personal. And in your trial and in your test, the tri why can he say the trial of your faith is more precious than gold? Because you meet God in it. I meet God in the furnace. Hello, Daniel 3? Hey, O King Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful to answer you. We don't need to answer you, 17-year-old boys. We don't need to answer you. Our God can deliver us. We know Jesus. Hallelujah. I know Jesus. You, know, you can't say his name, you know, got in the government or in, in, in school. Imagine that. You can't, he said, you can't say Jesus' name in this school. I said, you better, put, you better find some duct tape because I don't listen to anybody. One time I was, I, I was in, there was a parade for a presidential election, and it was Michael Dukakis and Jesse Jackson. They were marching down the street. So I took all of our kids out of school, and I, I got right in front of their faces. I said, excuse me. I said, you want, us, you want us to sign an autograph? No, I said, I want your name written in heaven. You need to be born again. <laughs> it was like interesting. You know what? Don't be intimidated by people. Are you with me? Don't be intimidated. They're just people. They're just dust. Whatever. Don't be intimidated by people. I'm not telling you to go out and break the law today, please. 
Even though Jesus rose from the dead, it was illegal. Roman government, it was illegal. Break the seals. No, no, it's illegal. Uh, but don't do that, okay? But you know what? I go to a, a, a ticket counter. I say, she says, uh, passport, please. I say, are you born again? I'll hold the whole line up. I don't give a flying rip about who's behind me. It's just, that's your problem. Find another line. I'm talking to her about her soul. You don't like it? Go find someplace else. I don't care if you're a Mr. Businessman. You're going to wait and listen. I said, you know, I, my wife goes out and she tells me I'll be back in five minutes. She goes into a furniture store. She, 35, 40 minutes. I'm like, she comes out and I'm like, what? don't you know why God, she goes, I was just doing what you always preach about. Evangelizing somebody that was hurting because of a divorce. I went, excuse me. <laughs> you know, uh, personal with people. You'll pray for them. Make personal prayers that God will put people in your path. And you can be personal to them. You might not be able to say everything that you'd like to say to them, but you could be their friend, amen? You can, you can, just, you can help somebody, whatever it may be. We get personal. With God is personal with me. I'm personal with God. I become personal with each other in the church as a place where there's personal relationships. And then our gospel becomes what? Very personal to individuals. Leading people to Christ, showing them the good news. What are we, by the way, what are we here for? Am I here to have a family, make money, have a good, safe, nice life? That ain't working out for me. Okay? No, and I have a great family, and I'm not saying a place to live, but I'm here to glorify God. And you glorify God by winning the lost and making disciples. So many people get distracted with so many impersonal things. So many impersonal things that they want to do. And they don't realize there's nothing wrong with them, but they must be submitted to a personal relationship to Jesus Christ. And I want to grow in that. Amen? How many of you want, don't you want to grow in that? Getting to know God, that I may know Him. And this is key. At the end of Moses' life, and I'll close. It said, he said, The eternal God is my refuge and my strength, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Who is a God like you? Moses, even though disappointed he couldn't go into the promised land, so what? He knew God. Amen? By the way, Moses got into the promised land. Matthew 17. He was on the Mount of Transfiguration. He was in the promised land. With a, and he was in there with a glorified body. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad this body's not going to be in heaven? I, I'm going to know who you are. You're going to know me by the features. But it's going to be glorified. No sin. No devil. No arthritis. I can play basketball every day. Slam dunk backwards. I got a personal God. No devil, no pain, no sorrow, no death. And by the way, do you know something? When Jesus said, I go to prepare you a place, in the Greek languages, in the first person singular, he's speaking to Peter. I'm going to prepare you. You're going to have a special place. What do you want in your house? Four kitchens? You can have them. I said, no, no, I got too much to clean. You want to clean. Angels will do it. Angels will do the cleaning. I want a full court basketball hoop in my house. <laughs> and an Italian restaurant. <laughs> I can eat real spaghetti. Real macaroni with real sauce. Personal. I go to prepare you a place. You personally. That's how God is personal. He meets them when they're hurting. He, two men on the road to Emmaus. Jesus is walking alongside of them. Two men. That's all. He leaves, all of, he leaves Jerusalem just to go after these two. And he's, listening, he's, he's walking alongside of them. I know they're trying to get in now. Father, we thank you that Jesus is personal. We pray today that this would be something that grows in our lives. If you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you're not born again today, say, Jesus, save me today. Come into my life and live in me. I want to know you as my personal Savior. You came personally to die for my sins. Your blood paid for my sins. I trust in who you are and what you've done on the cross today. If that's your prayer with our eyes closed and our heads bowed, just put your hand up. Jesus, I've, I've never asked you into my life. Come into my life today. Save me today. It's not the hand going up that saves you. It's confessing.
It's believing in the heart, confessing with the mouth, and you say yes to God. And for all of us today, God, help us. Give us grace. Give us truth. Give us life. Give us power to walk with you in a personal way. For we are the disciples whom you love. So thank you for this church. Bless our time today. In Jesus' name, amen.